And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. That's interesting. So what's the implication? Prior to being woken up, prior to recognizing nakedness and vulnerability, there was no reason for God, for man and woman to hide from God. Now where are they hiding from God? Well, they're naked. They're vulnerable. Okay, so think about this. Think about this. It's like, imagine that you have the capacity to live truthfully and courageously and forthrightly. Just imagine that. And then imagine why you might not do that. And then imagine, well, how about fear and shame? How, how would that work? Well, let's say that the idea of living forthrightly and truthfully and courageously is analogous, given what we already know about these stories, to walking with God in the garden. Well, what stops people from doing that? What stops people from hiding? Well, it's their own, it's a recognition of their own inadequacy. They look at themselves and they think, how in the world is a creature such as I supposed to live properly in this world with everything that's wrong with me? And so what do you hide from? Well, you, you go home, you sit on your bed for five minutes and ask yourself, what have you hidden from in your life? Man, you'll have books of knowledge reveal themselves to you in your imagination, right? You say, well, why are you hiding? Well, it's no bloody wonder you're hiding. It's no wonder that people hide. That's the thing that's so terrifying about this story. We woke up and we thought, oh my God, look at this place. Like, this is seriously, there's some serious trouble here and we're in some serious trouble and we're not what we could be. And so we hide. And that's what the story says. People woke up, they became self-conscious. They recognized their own vulnerability and that made them, made them hide from manifesting their divine destiny. It's like, yeah, that's exactly right. And the Lord God, I love this part of the story. And that's so funny. And the Lord God called, and we could use a little humor at this point. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I, I was afraid because I was naked. So in case there was any doubt about that, that's why. And I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? Where have I commanded you that you should not eat? And this is where Adam shows himself in all his post-fall heroic glory. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So that's such, man, that's such, that it's so, you know, again, there's a modern feminist interpretation of the story of Adam and Eve that makes the claim that Eve was portrayed as the universal bad guy of humanity for disobeying God and eating the apple. It's like, fair enough, you know? Looks like she slipped up. And then she tempted her husband and, you know, that makes her even worse, although he was foolish enough to immediately eat, so it just means she was a little more courageous than him and got there first. But it's Adam who comes across as really one sad creature in this story, as far as I'm concerned. Look at what he manages in one sentence. It's like, first of all, it wasn't him, it was the woman. And second, he even blames God. It's like, it wasn't just the woman, it was, it was that woman, and you gave her to me. <laughs> and she gave me of the tree and I did eat. It's like, so hey, Adam's all innocent, except now he's, not only is he naked and disobedient and cowardly, and ashamed, he's also snivelly, backbiting. He rats her out like the second he gets the opportunity and then he blames God. It's like, and that's exactly right. That's exactly right, man. You go online and you read, you read the commentary that men write about women when they're resentful and bitter about women. You read it, it's so interesting. It's like, it's not me, it's them. And not only that, what a bloody world this is in which they exist. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing, and it is absolutely pathetic. It's not all that happens, though, when they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because it's not called the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of nakedness. It's called the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and so I thought about this nakedness, knowledge of good and evil idea for a very, very long time, like about 20 years, puzzling it out. What the hell is the relationship between discovering that you're naked and discovering good and evil. And then one day, mostly because of studying totalitarianism, totalitarianism and the atrocity, the proclivity for people to commit atrocity in the service of their group belief, 
or maybe just because that's what they were like, um, clued me in. And I thought, I see, this is one of the things that really makes people different than animals. It's like, you know, it's one thing to realize that you're naked. To realize that you're naked means that you know that you're limited in time and space, that you're mortal and that you're, you're subject to degeneration and to social humiliation and to your own harsh judgment, all of that nakedness, to know that you're vulnerable against the world and definitely a source of shame um, because of that. Um, and, and a, a felt lack of self-sufficiency. And, and no wonder, and no wonder. Um, it's understandable. But the other thing is, is that this is, and this is the rub. It's like, if you're out in the veld and you're not being very careful, and a hungry lion jumps on you and eats you, you don't really think of the lion as evil. I mean, you might right at that moment, but, you know, philosophically, it's not evil, it's just hungry. And as soon as it's not hungry, then it goes and has a sleep and it's not up to some malevolent trick. It's, it's done for the day. But human being, that's a whole different sort of creature. And because human being is capable of doing terrible things to someone else and consciously so. You think, well, what's the connection between that and nakedness itself? And it seems to be this is like, here's the thing is that once I realize that I can be hurt, you know, I have a self-conscious model of my own vulnerability. Then I can generalize that to other people. I can think, oh, this is interesting. Here's how I can be hurt by myself. Here's how I can be hurt by society. Here's how I can be hurt by nature and by the unknown. And what that implies is that, well, you can be hurt with exactly the same mechanisms. And that immediately becomes part of my, what would you say, my repertoire of ability. And then all of a sudden the, the world is no longer a walled, a walled garden and a well-watered place, but it's a moral story because with that ability to inflict suffering comes the knowledge of good and evil. As far as I'm concerned, those are identical propositions. Because now we have the choice, a deep choice, about how we're going to treat ourselves and each other. We can inflict tremendous pain and suffering on each other in a very voluntary and, and conscious manner. In, in, in a way that no other animal can manage. And that's the dawning of the moral sense. That capacity we now have to choose to mitigate or exaggerate suffering and and that's not all but it's a huge part of it